Hi everyone, welcome to Mobile Development for iOS and Android Virtual Developer Day, brought to you by the Oracle Technology Network. My name is Joe Huang, and I'm part of the Mobile Application Development Tools team here at Oracle. This session will focus on user interface design and device services interaction for Oracle ADF Mobile. First, a disclaimer that any information around future direction of ADF Mobile is intended for information purposes only and are subject to change. In this lesson, let's first look at the user interface layer within the ADF Mobile application. As discussed previously, ADF Mobile applications are running inside a native container as a native application. Within this native container, the user interface is supported by an embedded web view. An embedded web view essentially is, well, for lack of a better term, an embedded browser running inside a mobile application. This allows the native mobile application to display user interface developed using HTML. HTML-based user interface can be supported across multiple mobile platforms, and this allows for maximum reusability of code with minimum rewrites. ADF Mobile has a very flexible hybrid architecture and you have a variety of options to deliver user interface. The primary mechanism to deliver your user interface is through the ADF Mobile AMX components. These components are similar to Java's Fairer Faces components and AMX files is similar to the JSPX file for ADF Faces based applications. The AMX files are optimized to deliver user native user experiences and are rendering locally on the device. The AMX files are generated into HTML file controls during runtime. You can also dramatically enhance your server-based web application by adding them to the ADF Mobile as remote URL. For example, you may have an ADF Faces or ADF Mobile browser-based application on the server and then running inside the ADF Mobile container you can still access device services through a JavaScript interface through Cordova. Lastly, you can also use your favorite HTML5 framework to, to create a local HTML page, then include those into an ADF mobile application. You can still access device services through a JavaScript interface, as well as the embedded Java virtual machine. The best part of the support is, well, you can mix a combination of these content within the same application giving you maximum flexibility to create your mobile application. Okay, now you know you have options to create a user interface, but when should you use one mechanism versus the other? Well, in general, you should consider ADF Mobile AMX page as the primary options to create a user interface. ADF Mobile AMX is declarative, metadata-driven, so it's more maintainable and it's easier to work with. You can also ensure cross-platform compatibility, such as upgradability. We'll re continue to refine and expand the set of AMX components, so you can always expect to leverage the latest and greatest technology from Oracle. On the other hand, remote URL is useful to integrate server-generated web pages to be fully integrated into an ADF mobile application. If you have an existing website that needs to access device services, for example, then you can add the website into the ADF mobile application and call the Cordova plugin through the JavaScript interface. For example, you may want to call the camera to take a picture from your website and then upload that picture to the server. Lastly, local HTML is very useful in complementing AMX component with virtually any HTML5 based user interface. If there are functionality that ADF Mobile AMX can't support yet, you can leverage local HTML content to deliver that functionality to the end user. Local HTML pages can still access the JVM and Cordova plugin through the JavaScript interface so it gives you full access to virtually all key framework services. For example, if you want to in, uh, embed a custom signature capture page or a Google Map page that support dragging and dropping the markers. Well, so let's look at AMX pages now in more detail. AMX is the declarative UI construct for ADA mobile applications. It hosts a UI for a single page or view. It is XML pay based and uses the AMX component set to lay out its UI. 
It uses the EL or expression language to bind the data on the page to either the ADF model or to a backing beam. One key to note is that EL is dynamic in the ADF mobile. If the value in EL that EL represents have changed, then the user interface hooking into these EL expression can also be updated without any sort of page navigation or partial page refresh. As long as you call the data change event, uh, event APIs in your data layer, the value of that user interface would be updated instantly. This is very different from the request and response model that ADF faces requires. As a matter of fact, this is a much more efficient mechanism to refresh the user interface. Now, AMX pages functionality can be further enhanced through backing beams. Backing beams supports application, page flow, and view scopes. In most scenarios, you will probably use page flow as the scope as the value would persist across the page. Application scope should only be used if you want to share values across different features. For example, if you want to share data between AMX and local HTML feature, then you will store values and invoke backing beams with the application scope. Backing beams can access bindings on the page, but it cannot directly update the value of the UI component. Backing beams in JSF or, Java, uh, or ADF faces pages can uh, indeed update the UI component values, but with ADF mobile, you'll need to go through the model layer and use the data change event APIs to refresh the value dynamically. Well, now let's take a look at different AMS components you can use to build your application. There are over 100 components covering page layout, data display, operations, and data visualization components. Oracle will continue to expand this set of components over time, as well as supporting device native look and feel for the platform is running on. Furthermore, you can fully customize the look and feel of these components through custom style sheets or CSS. To construct the page, you will simply drag from the component palette in JDeveloper and drop into the source or structure pane in JDeveloper. Please note that many of the ADF faces components also have the same name as these AMX components. The functionality of these AMX and ADF faces components are similar, but AMX is optimized for mobile. Also, rendering, the rendering technology and implementation are very different. However, if you have prior understanding of ADF faces components, you will also have some general idea of what similar AMX components would do. ADF Mobile AMX provides you with layout component that lets you arrange UI components in the page. Well, usually you begin building pages with these components and then add other components that provide other functionality in either inside these containers or layout components or as a child components to the layout components. Some of these components provide geo geometry management functionality, such as capability to stretch when placed inside a component that stretches. You add a layout component by dragging and dropping it into an ADF Mobile AMX page from the component palette, just as you, if you were using ADF faces on JSF page. Then use the property inspector to set the component's attributes. The key layout components are core page structure, table layout, panel layout, list views, panel splitter, pop-up, and iterator. At the root and our, or the highest level of AMX page, you have a view. A view is a core page structure component that's automatically inserted into an ADF mobile AMX file when the file is created. This component provides a hierarchical representation of the page and a structure that represents a single ADF mobile AMX page. On the next level down, we have a panel page. A panel page is a component that allows you to define a scrollable area of the screen for laying out other components. You can use facet components to define areas on the page, such as the header or a footer on the parent layout component. The position and rendering of the facet are determined by its name. Okay, so for example, component inside the facet named header will be rendered across the top of the page as a bar that shows the name of the page. The component inside the primary facet would be rendered on the upper left corner of the page, 
which is typically used to display back button, for example. The table layout is probably the most common layout component you'll use in a mobile application as it allows you to lay out various UI components on a page using relative width and height. You can embed multiple layers of table layout, which is especially useful when laying out more complex views for iPad and Android tablets. It is also far more efficient than using CSS to control the size of the component on the screen, especially if you have to use embed EL expressions for device form factors to achieve a certain layout in the CSS. Within the table um, layout, you can embed one or more rows using a row layout. And within the row layout, you can embed one or more cells or columns as cell format. And within cell format, you can, of course, embed another table layout. You can control the size of these components using both absolute value or relative um, value. So let's say um, you can say a cell format should take up 50% of the width. You should always try and ensure the width of these uh, cell format adds up to 100% to avoid any ambiguity. The panel group layout is a basic layout component that lays out its children horizontally or vertically. Next, the panel form layout. The panel form layout positions components so that their labels and fields align horizontally. In general, the main content of the panel form layout component is comprised of input components, such as input text, and designed and designing the page layout selection components, such as choice. Using the panel label and message component to place a component which does not have a label attribute inside of a panel form layout. These components usually input output text, buttons, or links. Now let's look at a component that's especially important for the tablet layout. This component is called panel splitter. You use the panel splitter component to display multiple content areas that may be controlled by a left side navigation pane. The panel splitter components are commonly used on a tablet device that have larger display size. A panel splitter typically contains a navigator facet and a panel item component. The navigator facet represents the left side of the screen where you would typically place the list view to allow user to pick a record. The panel item component represents the content area of a panel splitter. Each of those panel splitter components must have at least one panel item. And each panel item typically then contains, for example, ta a table layout components, which in turn arrange different UI components within a panel item. A, common, a very, very common UI design is to show and hide multiple panel items in the panel splitter. This is useful to show, for example, different parts of the information for a record. For example, for employees, you may have one panel item for displaying contact information and another to display a map where the, the employee is located. You can then show and hide different panel items using selection component like a select one button. Panel item also supports animation so as it is displayed, it can animate across the screen. Lastly, you can also have multiple panel items in the navigator facet. Well, next, let's look at a component that's at the same level as the panel page. This is called pop-up. You use the pop-up component to display a pop-up window, and the pop-up window can essentially be as complex or as simple as a panel page. You typically declare your this component as a child of the view component. You will use the following operations in conjunction with the pop-up component. First, you will have the show pop-up behavior operation that represents a declarative way to show the pop-up in response to a climb trigger event. It is specified using the type attribute of the show pop-up behavior. You can also specify display location the pop-up by specifying the align and align ID properties of the show pop-up behavior. Now, the close pop-up behavior operation represents the declarative way to close the pop-up in response to a client trigger event. Now, to display collections of data, you can either use list view, iterator, or carousel. 
List view is probably the most common mechanism to display a list of data. Iterator behavior is similar to ADFaces component with the same name, as well as Carousel. However, all of them are styled and rendered to be mobile optimized. Well, let's look at the list view a little bit more closely now. List view in ADF Mobile has a similar functionality as ADF Faces tables, as it is the primary mechanism to display data collection. List view basically contains one or more list items. The list item lets you define one of the following either a row that's replicated based on the number of items in the data collection. In this case, list views would be repeated for each of the record in the collection. Or it could represent a static view that is produced by adding a child list item component without specifying the list views var and value attributes. You can add as many of these static items as necessary, which is useful when you know the content of the list at design time. In this case, the list behaves basically like, like a set of uh, menu items. You can specify the list view to be displayed using dividers, similar to the contact application on your mobile devices. However, it is important to remember that the list view does not automatically sort data. So if you do decide to use dividers, you need to make sure that data is pre-sorted when it's being retrieved and stored. Okay. Uh, you can create fairly sophisticated list views by adding table layout or group layout components in the list items. And the list item can also respond to gestures through set proper listener or action listener components. There are also some commonly used components for navigation, such as buttons and links. For input data, ADF Mobile support input text, slider, and input date components. For selecting data, select one choice, Boolean, radial button, checkbox, select item, and select buttons are supported. To visualize data, ADF Mobile supports charts, graphs, gauge, and maps. This is critical for any enterprise application as data visualization component helps to user to very quickly understand data with easy to understand graphs. Charts and gauges are primarily used to display data and would need to be backed by data collections. As for mapping components, there are really two types of maps. One is called geomaps. Geomaps allow you to embed geographical map to an ADF AMX page and can be used to display one or more locations using markers. Marker can also be used to trigger operations, so you can, for example, select a marker and update the user interface to display the detailed information about that location. You can choose to use Oracle Map Viewer or Google Maps to provide the map itself. As for thematic map, it allows you to overlay data points on top of virtual maps. This is particularly useful for displaying demographic type of data. You can also use a custom mapping background in thematic maps and then drop the data points to allow user to essentially explore a different part of that background image. For example, you can use the image of a car as the background and then use data points to allow user to select different part of that car. Now for navigating between different features within ADF mobile application, you will use Springboard or the navigation bar. Each item on the navigation bar represents a feature in the application. Now to navigate between different AMX pages within a feature, you can use list item or command buttons. The navigation logic comes from task flows and the target of that navigation can either be a page or another task flow. Of course, it is more common to navigate to another page. Now, since we brought up the subject of task flow, let's look at what, what an ADF controller is. ADF controller defines the page flow of your ADF mobile application. It allows you to specify the logic and the transition animation between pages. Its behavior is very similar to ADF Faces web controller, although the implementation is completely different. Also, ADF mobile controller can only support a subset of task flow component that's needed by a mobile application. Now, there are two types of task flow within the ADF mobile controller. First is a bounded task flow. This is the most common task flow you will use in an ADF mobile application. Each feature within the ADF mobile application points to a bounded task flow, and then each bounded task flow has a default activity 
as the starting point. This means that when you navigate to a feature for the first time, either after your application starts or after a feature reset, you will be directed to that default page. ADF Mobile also supports unbounded task flows, although it is less commonly used. It is really only needed if navigation across features are needed. It doesn't have a default activity as feature defines the starting point for that page. There's really, there can only be one unbounded task flow in an application, and it is implemented in the ADFC mobile config file. Now, let's take a look at how task flows and features relate to each other. First, we have the simplest scenario where a feature only points to a single AMX page. This is the people feature in this example. Next, these feature uses bounded task flows, which is the most common mechanism for laying out page flows. This means each of these features has its own task flow and page all navigate within its own feature. In general, your application would really need to leverage these bounded task flows. However, if you do need to navigate between features, you can lay out the views and control flow case in a bounded task flow. You can then use these control flow cases in the unbounded task flow to navigate between pages within different features. Typically, you don't really need to do this, as you would simply navigate between different features by clicking on the springboard or navigation bar to do a feature navigation. You can create and use managed means in your mobile application to store additional data or execute custom code. You can use JDeveloper standard editing mechanism to reference backing and managed beings or backing beings and create references to them for applicable fields. Um, again, ADF Mobile supports these following scopes for managing or backing beings application, view, and page flow, or none. When you declare a managed being to an ADF Mobile application or in the ADF Mobile AMX application feature, the managed being is instantiated and identified in the proper scope, and the being's properties are resolved and the methods are accessed through the EL. Okay, ADF binding. When you create and drag and drop a data control to your page, you create a binding that connects the UI to the backend data and data services. You can also manually create the bindings, of course. A binding basically is an instance of the data control that specifically connects the user interface components. This is a very important concept to understand as all ADF applications connect UI and data layer through the binding concept. Now, another important concept in ADF and ADF Mobile are data controls. A data control is a wrapper that allows the framework to bind to data in an abstract way, regardless of its source. The data can be Java class, or web services, or any other source. The data control.dcx file in the mobile application contains the listing of all data controls defined for that project. Data controls are visualized in the data control palette which allows developer to drag and drop there to the source or structure pane in order to create data bound components. Okay, putting it all together, let's review the details of how AMX views communicate with the data layer. First, there are EL or expression language. EL expression language is a syntax that defines a linkage to an AMX page to another source. This is resolved during the rendering of the page and ties the data to the UI. EL expression are typically active connectors, so when the underlying data that EL expression points to changes, the UI the corresponding UI component is also updated. Next we have the bindings. Each AMX page has a backing page that holds the bindings called page definition file. This is a file called there's a file called datacontrol.cpx file that tells the framework the name of each backing page definition for each of the AMX page. Data controls. Data control is a wrapper that allows the framework to bind data to in an abstract way, regardless of its source. The data can be a Java class, web services for, or any other source. The data controls.dcx file contains a listing of all the data controls contain the project. 
The data controls are visualized in the data control palette, which allows the developer to drag and drop there to the source pane in order to create data bound components. Now, manage beings. Manage being is simply a Java class defining the task flow with an identifier and a scope. You can define managed beings in the top level on bounded task flow or in an individual bounded task flow. Data object is what we discussed in the last lesson. It's a Java class that's defined to be data holder for the object. It represents a single row of the data and define the attribute with appropriate getter and setter for the data. It does not itself retrieve data from any other data store. On the other hand, service object is a Java class used to define CRUD operations for the object. Okay, another important item to understand is the page definition file. There's one page definition file per AMX page, and it is created when data controls are dropped on the page. It defines which data controls are used on the page. There are basically two elements in the page definition. First is the binding. Each AMX page has a backing page that holds its binding called a page definition file. There is a file called datacontrol.cpx file that tells the framework the names of each backing page definition for each of the AMX page. We also have the executable. The, each binding on the page definition has to point to an executable. Typically, these are iterators that points to root of a data control or to the collection of data. Now, within the bindings, you will see attributes that represent individual executable attributes. Action maps to data control operations, whereas method maps to data control methods. Actions and method typically maps to command components like a command button, and the list typically represents a list of values, tree bindings that's used for, to represent all the data collection. On the other hand, executable holds data iterators and the data initializers. Data iterator holds data collection row, currency, and an invoke action specifies when an action or a method should be triggered. You may need to tweak or add invoke action to ensure the action or the methods are ex executed when with the certain application events. Okay, now let's see how the AMX page binding works with it while in action. Here we have an AMX page with corresponding page definition. And on the right side of the screen, we have a Java virtual machine running the corresponding data objects and service objects. First, the AMX page itself, the AMX page uses EL expression to link to the page definition. In this case, it refers to an attribute called name. Next. The name attribute in the binding points to the employee iterator in the page definition file. The iterator defines a link to a particular data control and data collection. In this case, the data control is located or based on the employee list service object and maps to the get employee method in the employee list class. The get employee method in turn contain code that instantiates the employee data objects, populates the array, and then return it to the get employee method. This means the get operation in a data control would return a collection of data objects. At this point, the data is being returned and populated to the binding, and the user interface is also populated with data. However, now the question is, what if the data is changed in the code? Well, let's see how the data change events are pushed to the user interface here. First, in the set of method of the data object, you would typically call the fire property change method. Property change method is a special method supported by ADF Mobile used to propagate changes in a single attribute to the user interface. It is automatically added by the generate accessor dialog box if the, the developer selects the notify listener when property changes checkbox when creating the data object. By default, you should always check this box. Now, when the fire property change method is called, the data would be pushed all the way through the ADF mobile model, page definition, and all the way to the UI right away. The change is instantaneous. 
This is now's 80th mobile application to behave like a native application, so data change are reflected right away. There's no page navigation or partial page uh, refreshes needed to push these changes to the user interface. On the other hand, when there's a collection data being refreshed, it would be inefficient to use the property change event APIs for each of those changes. Therefore, provider change event APIs are provided. Provider change event is fired through the provider change support dot fire provider refresh, fire provider create, fire create delete, and fire provider update methods. And these must be called by the developer in each of the CRUD operations in the service object. Therefore, you typically call these provider changes in the service object class. In this example, the CRUD operation in the employee list service object calls the fire provider chain refresh method, and the data change in the entire collection is propagated to the user interface right away. This allows you to retrieve sets of data and then have these sets of data refresh on the user interface. For example, when you add a record, you will simply call the fire provider create method to push the newly created record into the UI. Now, while data controls are typically used to access data, ADF Mobile also leverages data control to access device and application features. Both device and application feature data controls are created automatically when the application is created. So you don't need to explicitly create these data controls. You have the option of accessing these data controls either through Java code or declaratively through the user interface. Device data controls gives you access to email, SMS, contact application integration, GPS, and camera integration. We'll explore the device data control in more detail shortly. Application features data control allows you to control feature navigation, as well as show and hiding application level navigation feature, such as the navigation bar. This is very important for any application containing multiple features. Now, let's look at the device services integration more closely. One of the key advantages of running an application on a device as a native application is the close integration with device services. The key component for the device services integration are highlighted in blue. First, the device services box refers to the hardware and software interfaces provided by the mobile operating system itself. To access these device services, ADF Mobile embeds an open source product called Cordova. Cordova provides a platform pen interface to a variety of device services such as camera and contact list and therefore abstracted the framework from having to support different device native APIs. Cordova is delivered as a combination of native code and JavaScript interfaces and is an integral part to the ADF mobile framework. Serves exposed by Cordova are accessed through the ADF mobile's model layer, which allows ADF mobile application to fully interact with these services as part of the data layer. The ADF mobile supports the following device native services out of the box, email, SMS, contact list, GPS, and camera. Other services may be supported through Cordova plugins. However, Cordova support, general support for Cordova plugin is planned for, the future, uh, for a future release. Now let's look at different ways you can access device services. There are basically four ways. Through device data control, using EO expression objects, using Java APIs, and using JavaScript APIs. All of these mechanisms support different scenarios you will need to invoke device services. Well, first, let's look at the device services data controls. You can find the device services data controls and support a method in the data control palette in JDeveloper. You can simply drag and drop a data control to your page. Binding a UI oper a component can be created automatically as you do that. This is the declarative way of invoking the API without writing any code. If device services interaction is relatively simple, then you can use this data control to invoke it. For example, interacting with emails, SMS, start the GPS, or a very simple use of the camera. 
Next, you can access device properties through EL expression objects. This is applicable primarily for accessing device properties such as the screen size. You can reference these EL expression objects through the UI component. You can either directly reference it or you can use Expression Builder to add an EL expression. You will reference the device property EL expression as a type of device scope variable. For example, in the example here, the EL expression device scope dot device dot has camera would return either true or false, indicating the device has a camera or not. This is useful if you need to change UI displays based on device form factor, OS type, or availability of hardware, or so forth. Of course, you can also access device services through Java APIs. Most commonly, you would invoke device services Java APIs in AMX pages backing beans. Java APIs gives you a flexible way of calling device services. There are several instances where you will want to call device services through Java interface. One is when you want to more easily handle air conditions to act to pro and to process any output. You may decide to suppress certain errors and hide it from the user, or use it to invoke a different code path. Another reason is when input or output parameters are complex. For example, in order to create a new contact record in a local contact application, you will need to define a Java object with all the required field for a contact object. For example, first name, last name, office phone, home phone, etc. The created contact data control takes this Java object as an input parameter when creating the contact object. To invoke device services in Java code, you will use the device manager factory class and an instantiate a device manager object with the get device manager method. You can then invoke one of the supported method in the device manager object as shown. There are extensive Java docs for device services APIs. You can access Java doc in ADF mobile by start typing the Java object name and then right click on the Java object and select the Java doc entry. You will then see detailed explanation of the different Java APIs for the device services. Now, last but not the least, you can also invoke device services through JavaScript APIs. We use JavaScript APIs when access device services from local HTML or remote URL page. You will also use JavaScript APIs from an AMX page if the Cordova functionality is not exposed as a data control in ADF Mobile. This gives you a very powerful and flexible mechanism to integrate a variety of content into a single application while still be able to support device access for all features. Now, in order to invoke device services from local HTML page, you will need to add the JavaScript references for Cordova in your application. There's an example of that code in the index .html file of the Hello World sample application. And this sample application is shipped as part of the ADF mobile extension. To invoke device services from a remote URL page, you will need to download the correct version of the Cordova JavaScript library directly from Cordova and then add it to your server-side web application. You will need to check ADF mobile developer guide for the correct version of the Cordova JavaScript file that you need to download. Okay, that's it. We just cover all the different ways you can access device services from an ADF mobile application. Well, let's look at what we have covered in this session. We first cover the different options for constructing user interface in an ADF mobile application. Just to recap, you can use ADF Mobile AMX, local HTML, and remote URL. We then discuss the different components available to construct the user interface. We then talk about different type of task flows supported by ADF Mobile. We tackle the subject of ADF Mobile binding, data controls, and data change events. Lastly, we cover the different options to access device services. This marks the 
end of the ADF Mobile UI Design and Device Services Integration session in the ADF Mobile Virtual Developer Day. Next, you'll have the opportunity of building an ADF Mobile application and apply all you have learned in a hands-on lab. You'll see the entire UI layer, binding layer, and data services in action. If there are any questions around the past two sessions, the hands-on lab should also help to clear it up. Now, we'd like to invite you to join this large, vibrant ADF Mobile community. We have a pretty significant engagement through a variety of social media channels like Twitter and Facebook. However, the two most important links to remember are this, www.oracle.com mobile, which would link you to the ADF Mobile landing page on the Oracle Technology Network. This landing page contains links to all kinds of ADF Mobile resources as you will need to create your mobile application. Also, check out the ADF Mobile team blogs at blogs.oracle.com slash mobile. The blog not only contains useful articles and samples on developing ADF Mobile applications, it also contains links to more code samples and blogs from the ADF Mobile community. Thank you for attending the ADF Mobile UI design and device integration session. Bye for now.